This is modern-day Mexico City, but around 500 years ago it was the centre of the great Aztec Empire that covered this part of Central America. In Aztec times, the site of Mexico City was an island in a lake, Lake Texcoco, where the Aztecs had their capital city, Tenochtitlan. At its center were fine palaces and great temple pyramids. The Aztecs were a wealthy and well-organized society, and the people followed strict rules and didn't question things. They had their own religion, which included human sacrifices to their gods, the sun, the earth, and the rain. The Aztecs were warlike people and their warriors kept neighboring tribes in order and held the Aztec Empire together. It was also an empire that people from Europe had never seen. But that was about to change. It was 1518, the Aztec ruler Moctezuma II was getting nervous. He'd been hearing reports of strange boats off the distant coast of his empire in the east, and his priests told him they'd seen strange sights. A comet in the sky, a great tidal wave in the lake around the city, and a mysterious fire in one of the temples. They thought this could mean that one of their gods, Quetzalcoatl, was about to return from the east, as Aztec legend had foretold. Moctezuma had good reason to be nervous. Moctezuma didn't know it, but explorers from Europe had begun to sail across the Atlantic Ocean and land in Central America. The first was Christopher Columbus in 1492, and many more followed, including a Spanish expedition led by Captain Hernán Cortés. In 1519, Cortés and his men arrived in Central America in search of gold, to claim the land for the King of Spain, and to convert any people they found to Christianity. He had about 500 soldiers armed with crossbows, muskets, a few cannon and horses. As Cortés and his men set off inland, they were amazed to see signs of cities and civilizations and to hear stories of a rich and powerful people, the Aztecs. Cortés continued his journey in search of the fabled Aztec Empire. He travelled over the mountains until he came upon the people of Tlaxcala, who attacked. The battle raged on this hilltop. It was a close thing, but with the guns and horses of the Spanish pitched against the wooden clubs and stone-tipped arrows of the Tlaxcalans, the Spanish finally won. If the Spanish had lost this battle, the history of this part of the world could have been completely different. But the Tlaxcalans were smart. To avoid being killed by the Spanish, they did a deal. They explained that they were enemies of the Aztecs and would support Cortés's expedition against them. Cortés agreed. After all, several thousand Tlaxcalan warriors would be a great help in defeating the Aztecs. Cortés and his men with several thousand Tlaxcalans then advanced on the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan. They passed between the ring of volcanoes into the valley of Mexico and saw the city in the distance they could see that the city would be difficult to attack because it was surrounded by water and could only be reached by bridges, causeways or boat. But when the Spanish arrived at the edge of Lake Texcoco, the Aztecs let them cross the causeway that led to their island city. The route of the causeway that Cortés crossed to get to Tenochtitlan is now the main road into modern Mexico City from the south. This is where the lake ended and the island city of Tenochtitlan began. The Aztecs had allowed Cortés to cross the causeway to the island, but he must have been nervous. 
Why didn't they defend their city? Was he walking into a trap? It was too late to turn back now. And it was here, in November 1519, that Moctezuma, in all his finery, welcomed Cortes. Then, Moctezuma took Cortes to one of his grand palaces. Today, it's the Hospital of Jesus. We have to walk through accident and emergency, but Moctezuma led Cortes into a great room that looked out onto a beautiful courtyard. Here, one of the most important meetings in the history of the world took place between two civilizations who, until a few months before, didn't even know each other existed. Moctezuma had to be careful. Who was this white-skinned stranger who'd arrived from the east? Was he an enemy to be captured and killed? Or was he really the god Quetzalcoatl returning to rule his people who should be welcomed? What Moctezuma then said to Cortes is a puzzle. Oh Lord, you must be tired and have endured weariness. You have come to arrive on earth. You have come to govern the city of Mexico, which I have looked after for you. And now, it has been fulfilled. You have come. So, amazingly, Moctezuma seemed to be giving up his throne to the stranger Cortes. Maybe Moctezuma did think Cortes was an Aztec god returning to his people. Maybe he was playing for time while he worked out what to do. Maybe he was trying to lure Cortes into a trap. Or maybe he was just confused by the whole situation. Whatever he was thinking, Moctezuma welcomed Cortes and made the Spanish comfortable in one of his palaces. Cortes had made it to the center of the Aztec Empire without a fight. But he still hadn't completed his mission to take it over for the glory of Spain. The Spanish stayed here in an Aztec palace right in the city center. It's since been replaced by this government office. Here, Cortes and his men plotted how to capture the city from within while they were the guests of the Aztecs. Meanwhile, across the square in his palace, the Mexican National Palace is here now, Moctezuma was worried about what to do with Cortes. Was he right to let Cortes into the city and had he got Cortes exactly where he wanted him? Or had he made a big mistake? Moctezuma needed time to think, so for several months the Aztecs carried on their life as normal with the Spanish in their midst. The Spanish soldiers explored the city and the great temples and wrote about what they saw. It seemed like an enchanted vision. Like a dream so wonderful that I don't know how to describe this first glimpse of things never heard of, things never seen, nor things ever dreamed of before. They saw the Aztec gods. There seems to be one for every aspect of human affairs. For war, for crops, for water. It's not surprising these gods are hidden in darkness. Their sight is enough to frighten any man. They saw the sacrifices and the racks of skulls, and they were horrified. These idols are offered blood from the living hearts, torn from the breast of the still living victim. Cortes ordered his men to start destroying the Aztec statues. The Aztec priests were furious and demanded that Moctezuma do something to get rid of the Spanish. Moctezuma offered Cortes more gifts of gold, hoping that he'd take them and go away. But Cortes didn't go away. Instead, he had Moctezuma arrested and held captive in the palace. What an amazing thing to do here in the very center of the Aztec capital. Cortes was taking a huge risk, but he must have thought that holding Moctezuma hostage would protect him from any Aztec attack. 
but it didn't work. Spanish soldiers had killed some Aztec priests during a religious ceremony, so the Aztecs attacked the palace where Cortes and his men were staying. In the chaos, Moctezuma was killed. Some say he was killed by the Spanish, others say he was killed by the Aztec crowd as a traitor. Cortes and his men had to leave, in a hurry. They were chased by the Aztec warriors down this street towards the edge of the island. Soon they reached the edge of the island city, and from here the Spanish had to cross the open water of Lake Texcoco. Many fleeing Spanish drowned in the lake or were killed by Aztec warriors. When Cortes and the few men he had left reached the safety of the lake shore, they stopped here by this tree. It was July the 1st, 1520, and Cortes had failed to defeat the Aztecs, but he vowed to return. Defeated, Cortes and his men worked their way round the north of Lake Texcoco until they managed to meet up with their allies, the Tlaxcalans, ready to try again. One year later, in May 1521, they laid siege to Tenochtitlan, stopping food and water getting into the city and waiting for diseases to spread. The siege of Tenochtitlan lasted for three months and then Cortes and his men with his Tlaxcalan allies attacked the city. They advanced through the city street by street, fighting and killing Aztecs all the way. They destroyed and burnt the buildings as they went, including the great temples. The final battle was here at Tlatelolco in the north of the island in August 1521, where the great Aztec Empire was finally defeated. Here at Tlatelolco, this is all that remains of the Great Temple Pyramid, just the bottom of the steps. Within a few years of defeating the Aztecs, the Spanish had destroyed it all and built this church where the temple had stood. They even used stones taken from the Aztec pyramids they'd destroyed to build the church. So Cortes had done it. With a few men and his Tlaxcalan allies, he defeated the great Aztec Empire. Straight away, they started to make changes. First, they called the country New Spain to be ruled from Old Spain away across the Atlantic Ocean. One of the biggest Spanish buildings in Mexico City is the cathedral, built right where the old Aztec temples used to be. And this is the National Palace, built by the Spanish on the site of Moctezuma's palace. Very soon, there were no Aztec buildings left standing. But although their great buildings and their civilization had been destroyed, the Aztec people didn't disappear after their defeat by the Spanish. But they were in for a rough time. Many thousands of native Aztecs died because of the terrible way they were treated by the Spanish and from diseases brought over from Europe the Aztec people had become slaves. The Spanish also brought their religion with them from Spain. This is the church of San Agustin, just outside modern Mexico City. It was built on the shore of Lake Texcoco in 1536. Here, the Spanish built a monastery to house a team of monks and priests. Their job was to convert the Aztec people to the Spanish religion of Christianity. In this courtyard, the monks converted the Aztec noblemen to their new religion. Yeah. 
The Spanish monks also got the Aztec noblemen and priests to write down and explain all they could about the Aztec beliefs and ways of life. The Aztecs had their own special picture writing, which had to be explained to the Spanish. These Aztec books are called codexes and are an important source of information about Aztec life. You can see the Aztec picture writing with the Spanish monk's translation written alongside. The Aztecs took to Christianity fairly well because in some ways it was a bit like the religion they already knew. The Aztecs made human sacrifices to their gods to make sure the world kept going. While in Christianity, the Christian God allowed his own son, Jesus Christ, to be sacrificed on the cross to save all Christians. In Mexico today, there are Christian churches all over the country. This is the Basilica of Guadalupe in Mexico City. Every Sunday, people crowd into the Basilica for prayers and mass. There's no doubt that many modern Mexicans are serious and sincere Christians. Mexico cut its ties with Spain over 180 years ago and became an independent country. But it's still a Christian country and the people still speak Spanish, all thanks to Cortes and his men. So, what became of the Aztecs? There are a few remains of their great buildings. Some of the Codex books the Aztecs wrote for the Spanish still exist. And there are some fascinating Aztec objects in the museums. But it's not much. But while there's not much left to see of the Aztecs' great empire, they're still around in the imagination and the mind. These vast wall paintings show how one modern Mexican artist, Diego Rivera, imagined how the Aztec Empire looked at its peak. These pictures celebrate a lost civilization with fine warriors, with great rulers, with skilled musicians, with expert craftsmen, and with successful traders. All a distant memory. But most of all, the Aztecs live on all around us because many people in present-day Mexico are descended from the Aztecs. The Aztec Empire has gone, but their stories, their memories and their traditions live on. <laughs>